Thanks so much for joining us today um, during your lunch hour or during the afternoon. I'm going to give a couple seconds for everyone to get settled into our virtual room. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. My name is Christina Iptoma and I'm mom to Osteo Angel Dillon and Director of Scientific Programs for MIB Agents. And today on Osteobytes, we are joined by Dr. David Schulman, the pediatric oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He studies novel therapies and biomarkers for patients with advanced sarcomas, and he's joining us today to discuss the Leopard Study, Liquid Biopsy in Ewing Sarcoma and Osteosarcoma as a Prognostic and Response Diagnostic. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulman, for joining us on Osteobytes today. We are thrilled to have you. Um, and also thank you to Walker, our panelists today, for joining us. A little bit more about our guest today. Dr. Schulman is a physician scientist and pediatric oncologist at the Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center with a clinical focus on the care of young adults with sarcomas. His primary research interests include development of novel therapies and precision biomarkers for adolescents and young adults with sarcomas. As an undergraduate at Union College and medical student at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Schulman focused on healthcare system development in rural resource poor settings. As a resident in the Boston Combined Residency Program in Pediatrics, he began a series of clinical research projects relevant to pediatric oncology. Dr. Schulman completed his fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at the Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center in 2019. And during that time, he began research focused on the use of circulating tumor DNA in patients with Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma, for which he was awarded a 2018 Conquer Cancer Young Investigator Award and a 2020 Career Development Award, a Boston Children's Career Development Award, and a Harvard Catalyst KL2 Award. Your uh, fireplace mantle must be very full, Dr. Sean. Um, he now leads multiple early phase clinical trials of novel agents for patients with solid tumors. And he also leads a national liquid biopsy study for patients with Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma known as a leopard study, which he is gonna be talking about today. Um, just one announcement before we get started, registration is now open for our 2024 Factor Osteosarcoma Conference. It's going to be June 20th to 22nd in Cleveland at the newly renovated Hotel Cleveland. And Factor is really unique in that it brings together everyone in the osteosarcoma community. We have clinicians, researchers, patients, caregivers, patient advocates, funders, and industry. And if you're listening to this webinar, then you belong there. You will come to collaborate and leave re-energized and inspired. Um, register soon to take advantage of our early bird registration rate of $300. Um, that ends on February 28th. Um, so I will put the registration link in the chat so you can check that out. And both Dr. Shulman and our panelists today, Walker, were at Factor last year um, and made a connection, which is awesome. Um, in fact, Walker was our opening keynote speaker last year. So Walker, could you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi, my name is Walker. I'm, a, I'm part of this year's Junior Advisory Board for MIB. And obviously, as Christine already said, I had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Showman at Factor and get to know a little bit about his research. But I'm really excited for a more in-depth presentation today. And so you can take it from there, Dr. Showman. Uh, well, well, thank you so much, um, Christina and Walker. I'll, I'll share my screen in, in just a second, but I'll I'll, I'll echo what Christina said in, in, in saying that, Walker, your, your opening speech at Factor last year was really a, a highlight of a meeting that had a lot of highlights. So um, I, I still remember it well. Um, Appreciate it. All right, Christina, I'm shared properly. Yes, looks great. Fantastic. Um, so again, I really appreciate the introduction and, and especially pre appreciate the opportunity to share an update on the Leopard study today and a little bit of background about um, the work I do um, with, with um, a large number of collaborators actually interested in moving liquid biopsies forward for patients with osteosarcoma. Um, I'll start by giving a, a little bit more sort of background about the work I do and in, in kind of my specific interests. Um, I, I really view my my job at Dana Farber is um, uh, when I come to work every day, finding uh, new ways to try and improve outcomes for adolescents and young adults with sarcomas like osteosarcoma through um, direct care of patients. Uh, I have a young adult clinic for patients who are under 40 years of age with sarcomas uh, and then do my, my inpatient hospital at time at Boston Children's. 
my research is really focused exactly as Christina uh, said on clinical translation of novel therapies for adolescents and young adults with sarcomas. And then um, really thinking about clinical translation of novel biomarkers, including liquid biopsies that we'll talk about today for different purposes, um, but in particular risk stratification, which is the focus of the Leopard study, uh, monitoring disease, including looking for minimal residual disease and disease surveillance, and then use of um, use of targeted therapies informed by novel biomarkers. And I really view these things as, as being entirely overlapping, um, as shown on the right. And so it really is a, a, a you know important problem that that um, we've identified over now a couple different decades is um, the the real lack of validated molecular biomarkers for patients with bone sarcomas and particularly osteosarcoma. Um, osteosarcoma, I think is well known here, is the most common malignant bone tumor seen in adolescents and young adults. And while um, many patients with localized tumors are, are cured with, with the therapy we have today, outcomes really have not improved uh, substantively in decades and outcomes for patients with advanced disease still remain poor. And, um, you know, in, in, even for patients who we do cure, the, the burden of late effects or side effects from the treatment we give is, is really tremendous. And sort of to, to highlight this problem in a different way, you could imagine two patients who come into clinic. Um, these are young adult patients who I might have seen in my clinic and are sort of partially fictionalized. But the first patient you could imagine is a 30-year-old who has a localized osteosarcoma of the left distal femur or just right above the knee. And um, the patient on the right is a 28-year-old who has a localized osteosarcoma of the left proximal femur, sort of up towards the pelvis. And um, we know that um, patients have differences in their disease biology and the clinical um, sort of features with which they present. But in fact, today we really give everybody the same chemotherapy, um, methotrexate, doxorubicin, and um, cisplatin. You get um, a couple cycles of that and then have local control and then more chemotherapy and then we do surveillance. And we know that probably for a very small number of patients, actually, um, surgery might have been curative, looking back many decades ago when we didn't always give chemotherapy. Um, and then conversely, there are some patients who get this chemotherapy um, and unfortunately does not cure their disease. And then there's patients in the middle where it seems to be um, kind of the right amount of chemotherapy or the right chemotherapy to prevent relapse. But we have not been able um, to really um, identify which patients may need more chemotherapy or different chemotherapy, which patients may need less chemotherapy or which patients this is really the right treatment for. And this is in stark contrast to many other diseases affecting young children or older adults in which we can use clinical features and molecular features and other tools to really help um, risk stratify or personalize treatment to optimize chance of cure and minimize, um, minimize uh, toxicity associated with treatment. And so you could imagine someday if, if we had better tools to do this, we might know that actually the patient on the left would have a very high chance of cure with actually just doxorubicin and cisplatin um, in local control. And then that patient could go into surveillance. They could potentially have less risk of um, uh, heart toxicity from the doxorubicin. They might have less risk of infertility, um, less risk of second cancers. Whereas the patient on the right, we might have a way of saying, well, actually MAP is, is not very likely to provide a good outcome for that patient and they need um, MAP plus something novel or, or an entirely novel regimen. Um, and so um, my, my research is, is really designed to try and help us figure out better how we can risk stratify patients and have a better understanding of who might need more or less therapy and in the future be able to inform clinical trials that could, could start to try and answer some of these questions. So circulating tumor DNA is the particular biomarker that I spend the most time thinking about. And we can start with just a little bit of background on what, what exactly circulating tumor DNA is. Um, we often refer to this as, as liquid biopsy, and liquid biopsy is sort of the big umbrella term. And within liquid biopsy, there's different things you could look at. Um, there's um, ctDNA is, is one component of that. There's um, extracellular vesicles and other little bits of um, uh, tumor cells that float around in the blood that you can access with a blood sample. 
But for circulating tumor DNA, um, what we know is that when you collect a blood sample um, in a patient who has um, osteosarcoma or another, uh, another type of cancer, um, there are regular strands of DNA that float around. Those may have come from the cells that line the blood vessel or white blood cells that float around in the blood vessels. And then there can also be DNA that actually comes directly from a tumor cell. And so when you collect that blood sample, we spin it down, we, we, we um, isolate the plasma, which is where these little bits of DNA live. Um, we can then analyze those with different types of sequencing or different types of next generation sequencing. And there's lots of different ways to do this. We've kind of fundamentally taken the approach of, of typically starting with um, very low coverage sequencing of the whole genome. Um, and this is really just sort of sparsely sequencing along all chromosomes and then looking for um, changes in copy numbers of different chromosomes. And so you can see here in this particular example, um, there's some um, parts of the chromosome that seem to have been amplified or duplicated. Um, and we can compare that to uh, a regular genome and, and try and quantify the amount of tumor DNA that we think is in the blood. Conversely, you can look for something specific. And so for patients with Ewing sarcoma, which is an, an analogous um, bone and soft tissue sarcoma, we would look for the particular fusion that defines um, that tumor using a next generation sequencing assay that's actually ve just very focused on finding that particular marker within the genome. And then we can also do things like droplet digital PCR to look for more specific markers um, that might be very focused on a genomic event that we already know a particular patient has. And, and really all of these things can be put together into clinical circulating tumor DNA. And we, we now actually have tests that you can order in the clinic from commercial companies that will give you sort of various versions of this. Um, and you have um, some feature of the circulating tumor DNA and you can get some particular output. So um, typically for um, our sort of um, copy number based or fusion based circulating tumor DNA quantification, we would get some um, hopefully percentage of the total amount of circulating tumor DNA in the blood. We can look for um, single nucleotide variants if there's a particular variant we're interested or what we call copy number variants, um, such as um, uh, gains or amplifications in MYC, which we see in osteosarcoma. And um, to think a little bit more about really how we do this specifically in osteosarcoma, we, we know that osteosarcoma has a particularly um, uh, chaotic and fragmented genome um, that involves lots of um, changes in copy numbers of the chromosomes and translocations. And that for these tumors, at some point in their development, there's sort of an explosion of, of the genome and a reorganization of the genome. And so it looks very, very different than uh, a normal genome and a normal cell in the body. And what we do, again, um, to quantify circulating tumor DNA for patients with these tumors is really focus on those changes in chromosomal copy numbers. And so um, for comparison here, the, these were data that came out of um, Dr. Crompton's lab in a 2018 publication, just showing that many of the copy number changes that we would see from directly sequencing um, an osteosarcoma tumor, if we sequence um, cell-free DNA, we can see those exact same copy number changes. And um, we use these data um, with an algorithm to actually give a quantification for how much of the DNA that's coming out of that blood sample um, has those copy number changes and is likely coming from the tumor, and we get, we get a quantification. And so in this particular instance, in this particular blood sample, um, we were able to use these copy number changes to estimate that there's approximately 22% of the DNA in the blood at that time point was coming was coming from the tumor cells. Um, Dr. Shulman, are copy number changes like a, a common common across all cancer types, or is it something about yeah? That's, that's, that makes that's it more actually cool? a really really great question, and um, I, I'm glad you brought that up. <clears throat> For um, kind of the most common cancers that we see in adults, which are typically carcinomas, things like um, lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer. Um, there are also copy number changes in those, but what often defines those cancers are, are recurrent hotspot variants or, or 
single nucleotide variants. Um, and uh, conventionally sort of in, the, in, in a lot of the early liquid biopsy development, most people really focused on looking for those variants. Those variants are also useful to find because for some diseases, there's drugs that have been developed to target them. Um, and um, that they're often a bit easier to find. What, what we found in a lot of pediatric cancers and a lot of sarcomas like osteosarcoma is there aren't as many of those recurrent hotspot mutations where like a single um, nucleotide is, is mutated in the same way in many different patients' cancer. Um, what we found is more common in, in pediatric and young adult cancers are what we call structural changes. And those can be translocations like in Ewing sarcoma where two genes come together, or they can be these widespread copy number changes. And um, kind of among cancers, I, I think osteosarcoma likely has one of the most sort of disorganized genome with different copy number changes and, and translocations. Um, but it certainly does happen in, in other cancers when sort of hallmark of cancer is, is um, ability to sort of for the cells to replicate out of control. But sometimes that also happens because they, they've sort of turned off mechanisms that help maintain the, the genome in an, in an organized way. Um, and, and so um, this kind of strategy um, wouldn't work as well in a tumor that didn't have a lot of copy number changes. And so for example, um, in some uh, uh, Ewing sarcoma tumors, we don't see a whole lot of copy number changes. So we were very focused on using the fusion in, in um, osteosarcoma, um, the, the, it's really defined by the presence of, of, of all of this sort of genomic disorganization. So it's a more reliable way to quantify circulating tumor DNA. So I don't, I don't know if I'm sort of getting it at your question there. Yes, no, that completely addresses. Thank you. Um, so the, the first kind of clinical question that we wanted to to you to, to try and answer with this um, technology to quantify uh, circulating tumor DNA is, can we use circulating tumor DNA at time of diagnosis to identify patients with high-risk disease? And um, conceptually, the, the way I think about this is you could imagine if there was somebody who um, came into um, a clinic with a, a new diagnosis of an osteosarcoma of the femur, like one of the... Um, uh, examples I, I mentioned earlier in the talk, you would um, take a blood test at that point. We would look for the amount of tumor DNA in, in the blood at that moment and ask the question, um, would um, patients who have high circulating tumor DNA, um, would that tell us something about the likelihood of, of therapy working and the treatment coming back? And conversely, my um, having low circulating tumor DNA at diagnosis um, actually tell us that it's less likely that osteosarcoma would come back in the future. And actually, when we really first asked this question, we truly didn't know, um, is having high or low circulating tumor DNA worse? But you could ask the question, does it tell you something about prognosis? And so back in, this was actually in, in 2017, 2018, we evaluated um, a cohort of patients who had banked um, pretreatment blood samples through children's oncology group banking studies now many years ago. Um, and um, we, we took those plasma samples and run these, these next generation sequencing assays and quantified the tumor DNA um, for each patient at time of diagnosis. And um, the, the assay we use that quantifies circulating tumor DNA based on these copy number changes is validated down to 3% tumor DNA in the blood. And so, if you have more than 3% tumor DNA, the test should give you um, an estimation of that um, tumor DNA. And if it's below 3%, it will uh, read out as negative or no tumor DNA detected, which doesn't necessarily mean there's no tumor DNA. It's just below the level that the test can detect. And so for those 72 patients, we found that 57% of them had circulating tumor DNA at time of diagnosis that was greater than 3%. And the rest of the patients had less than 3% circulating tumor DNA. Um, and so given that approximately half of patients had elevated circulating tumor DNA, we, we started with just the very fundamental question. If you have high CT DNA, um, is your outcome worse than if you have low circulating tumor DNA? Um, 
And it turned out um, that was true. And, and we published those results in the British Journal of Cancer in, in 2018. We subsequently looked at the cohort in a couple different ways. And we said, well, um, when we do um, uh, what's, what's called a, a COX analysis, or we look at the ctDNA level as a continuous variable, as the ctDNA level goes up, the likelihood of, of relapse goes up as well. And so we looked at some higher cut points, um, uh, including a cut point of around 15 or 18%. And we found that patients who have very high circulating tumor DNA really have a significant chance of having their disease come back. And conversely, if you have low circulating tumor DNA, that's actually a good thing. And it's more likely um, that you'll remain in remission um, after getting standard therapy. And so given that this was a relatively small in retrospective cohort, we needed a way to validate this. And, and so that was really the um, impetus for the Leopard study. Uh, as Christine mentioned at, at, at the beginning of the hour, um, Leopard stands for liquid biopsy and Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma as a prognostic and response diagnostic. Um, we launched the study in, in 2018, very shortly after that publication. And in the primary goal of the study, um, is to determine whether detectable circulating tumor DNA at diagnosis is associated with an increased risk of relapse. Um, this um, study is, it, it's a relatively straightforward study. It's open, um, I apologize, this should say um, osteosarcoma. It's open to patients with localized uh, non-pelvic osteosarcoma. And in the study, we collect pretreatment blood samples and then for about half the patients, they have the opportunity to provide on-treatment and post-treatment samples. And that dichotomy co comes because about um, half of the samples are obtained through the children's oncology group. Um, and so patients who um, would provide samples through the children's oncology group, which is part of their biology study, are, are only set up for a pretreatment sample. But anybody who enrolls through a primary studies uh, center can, can um, submit blood samples as they go through treatment. And then we collect um, patient data and, and capture that in a um, clinical database. It's really been a very, very collaborative effort. And I, I think in a rare disease like osteosarcoma, it's really the only way you can make progress. Um, again, this study opened in 2018. And over the years, we opened the study at 11 outside sites um, who, have, again, just been really tremendous collaborators. Um, and they're dispersed across the country. Um, for patients who would have participated through the children's oncology group, they, they would have been from sites other than primary study centers. Um, and uh, the, this study closed to accrual in March of last year um, and actually over accrued, uh, which we, we had, had pre-specified was a possibility in the protocol given it was a minimal risk study, but I, I think we're, we're just um, re really floored with the degree of participation from, from all of the different sites and, um, and, and patients who were approached by this study. Um, what we've started to learn is that just as we saw in our um, initial retrospective study in 2018, patients had a wide range of circulating tumor DNA levels at baseline. And when we've looked in this cohort, um, the percentage of patients with more than 3% circulating tumor DNA, if you're able to see my mouse, is very similar. It's about 60% of patients. And then as patients go through therapy, there was a blood sample that was drawn at 24 hours. Typically not a lot has changed at 24 hours. And then um, the next time point is before the first dose of high dose methotrexate, um, usually at three weeks. The second blood, uh, the, sorry, the third blood draw is before the second cycle of doxorubicin and cisplatin, before and after local control, and then at end of therapy, and then at surveillance for up to two years. And um, as you get out towards that second cycle, most patients have cleared their circulating tumor DNA, although there are some instances where circulating tumor DNA um, remains elevated, sometimes um, occasionally even after, um, even after surgery. And the, the update for where we are in the study at this time is that again, enrollment closed in, in March of 2023. Um, we've uh, done the, the primary analysis on the study, which was submitted to ASCO this year. 
um, and, and we hopefully have the opportunity to present in the future. Um, uh, and um, the analysis of the on-treatment circulating tumor DNA time points uh, is, is ongoing and will probably be subject to an analysis later in the year. Um, we also have some non-osteosarcoma updates on the study, which I'll just mention here. The um, primary Ewing sarcoma arm of the study, which had the exact same aims as, as the osteosarcoma arm of the study, completed enrollment in October of 2023. We haven't done the analysis on that yet, but it's planned for, for um, April or May of 2024. And then in early 2023, we opened what we call Part B of uh, the leopard study, and this is a clinical return of ctDNA results um, for patients with Ewing sarcoma during disease surveillance. And I'll give a little bit of background on 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 sort of how that evolved. And I I mention this only because um, I think it could potentially inform future directions for patients with osteosarcoma on this study or a related study. Um, what we've learned since. Um, the leopard study was opened in 2018 is that there's been many commercial liquid biopsy tests that have emerged um, from uh, a number of different companies. There have been tests that have been approved by the um, FDA as companion diagnostics. And these tests are sometimes sent in the clinic now. So I'll give you an example um, of a young patient with Ewing sarcoma who had presented a couple months after finishing treatment with um, new chest wall pain. Um, at end of treatment, scans all looked good. And then at three months, um, CT scans still looked good, but a follow-up PET scan showed a little bit enhancement of a rib. Um, it turns out ribs are, are, are difficult to biopsy, and um, the, the patient's team decided to repeat the scan in a month. And at that time, there was a little bit more enhancement of the ribs, some enhancement of an adjacent vertebral body, but still not anything that was particularly easy to go after with a biopsy and, and really nothing else on the scan. And so um, a, a commercial liquid biopsy was sent then a couple of weeks later. Um, and um, this showed a detectable Ewing sarcoma fusion um, at a, a relatively high variant allele fraction. And then the tumor fraction, which is a, a sort of aneuploidy based uh, quantification also was elevated. And so um, at that point, the patient was started on, on relapse treatment. And there are many examples like this, but there it turns out there are really commercial tests that function very similar to some of the research testing we're, use, we're using that um, are now, now available in the clinic. And um, given that these tests are available, that they're, they're starting to be used, and, and we really feel like um, it's important that um, one, we make these tests accessible when they're appropriate um, to patients and families and providers, but we also really study how to use them. We amended the, the leopard study in early 2023 to include um, a surveillance component for patients with either localized or metastatic Ewing sarcoma. And we, we focused on, on this because the particular test that we were using, the Foundation One Liquid CDX, um, includes coverage of the... Um, EWSR1 gene, and in particular, the intronic regions where fusions pop up. Um, and um, we, we partnered actually with um, Dr. Greensang at Dana-Farber, who is a, a really, really wonderful um, pediatric oncologist and communications researcher. Um, and the goal of this is to really try and better understand how these tests are being interpreted, what's the impact of using these tests in clinical practice, are they informative, are they helpful, are they causing increased stress and anxiety around times when um, patients and families may be otherwise getting very stressful um, scans following therapy, and are the providers understanding them? Um, many of the tests that are available right now don't cover just individual sort of genes or components of um, uh, tumors like osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, but actually cover um, hundreds of different genes that are involved in cancer. And so, um, for example, on these tests, you may find other variants that, that, are, that are confusing or difficult to interpret. Um, and I think we really, we really need to start to under, understand how to better use these, these, these tests in, in our practice. So um, really, the, the goal of this was to 
implement a clinical liquid biopsy test in a, in a um, clinically useful use case, such as surveillance here for, for patients with Ewing sarcoma, but also have um, a, an ability to really assess the, how they're being used and the, the, the impact on, on patients and families and providers. Um, even since we've opened this, there's multiple new liquid biopsies that have entered the commercial space. And, and so I, I think you could, could imagine that we might be getting close to a place where um, there's really an opportunity to, to run um, a, a similar study for patients with osteosarcoma. And, and, and certainly there, there may be studies out there that, that are already doing this that, I, that I'm not aware of, but um, you could imagine that um, going back to sort of our initial example, well, um, we're working on validating sort of what elevated retreatment um, and early um, CT DNA levels really mean. Do they tell us whether the treatment's working, not working? How could we implement that into a clinical trial to try and really improve outcomes? There likely are to be use cases out here once patients enter surveillance or if a patient um, has to deal with relapse disease and relapse treatments that might be more um, immediately applicable and, and, and have the potential for intervention. Um, and um, are, are likely to be much more straightforward to implement than early in treatment where um, we really need a phase three study to help um, uh, uh, see how we, we might be able to modify standard of care MAP chemotherapy. And so what you could imagine is that um, there, there's sort of a paired next generation sequencing test that quantifies circulating tumor DNA, helps us give us information about copy number variants such as um, MYC or CCNE1, another important copy number variant, osteosarcoma, could tell us whether there's relevant mutations and has a relatively quick turnaround time. Um, and this could be a test like the, the Foundation One assay, or there's tests from another a number of other companies, including um, Garden and Boston Gene and Keras and so on and so forth. Um, and then you could imagine that th those tests have a somewhat limited lower limit of detection, like the test that we use has a 3% lower limit of detection, and that's probably not good enough as a, as a real surveillance or monitoring test. And in those instances, you might use something that's more patient specific and has a much lower limit of detection and is really designed to follow um, disease in a highly sensitive way, but takes a little bit more time to set up. And so um, it points when you're doing um, surveillance or monitoring of treatment, you use the patient-specific tests, and it points when um, disease has progressed or come back, you use the NGS-based test to get more information to help guide next treatment decisions. Um, and, um, you know, this, this is really um, uh, sort of an, an, an idea or a vision how one might do this. There, there's many other um, liquid biopsy analytes as we talked about at the beginning of the hour. And, and so there's there's other many other great groups out there who are thinking about different ways to use liquid biopsy in, in, in tumors like osteosarcoma. Um, but that's that's really where I wanted to to end today. Um, we we hope that you know over the over the next year we have some real results from the leopard study that that we can share. Um, and, and think about um, the next steps of, of using these uh, tests to really try and actually um, improve cure rates and, and decrease toxicity. The, there's really a huge number of collaborators that uh, um, have, um, have, have contributed to this work. And um, I, I always wanna say a special thanks to my mentors, uh, Dr. Du Bois and, and Dr. Crompton. Um, We've had really fantastic collaborative sites and, and great um, funding support. And then most importantly, um, the, the many patients and families who've contributed to, to this research. That's what I have. That's great. Thanks so much, Dr. Shulman. Um, so everyone, please feel free to enter any questions into the Q&A. And we'll ask Dr. Shulman. Um, and I, and we already have one that came in. Walker, do you want to take that one? Yeah, the first question that came in uh, is just asking, is enrollment still open for EW Part B? Can patients that did not participate in ARM A enroll into ARM B? Uh, so like patients who are post-treatment uh, in ED. Uh, great question. Yes, enrollment's Part B remains open. 
Um, the, the studies open at um, uh, now many centers are around the country, but it's actually still possible to enroll if you're um, uh, if you're if you're not um, particularly at one of those study centers. There, there there's a way to remote enroll, um, and I, I think we're we're now entered in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and so we we should be searchable, but I'm I'm also happy to share a study email uh, offline if 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 that's helpful to anybody. Sounds good. Uh, there there was um, another question. I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll make I'll make one just eligibility clar criteria uh, clarification. I, I know not the primary focus um, of, of today's talk. For for Part B eligibility, um, patients need to be within six months of finishing their primary treatment. Um, so you could be anywhere on treatment or or within the first six months. Um, and th that's really because we, we think these blood tests are most likely to be useful within sort of the, the early post-treatment phase. Um, uh, and, and so we, we, we sort of had to, had to draw a line somewhere. Gotcha. Sounds good. Uh, there, there's another question that just came in asking, is ctDNA not taken up by circulating macrophages? Uh, slash cleared in the liver or spleen. Um, this this is another. They're they're great questions um, from everybody. So we we think circulating tumor DNA has a half life of actually only a couple hours um, in the blood. So it 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 is eventually cleared. Um, when when we um, when we designed the leopard study, which was a, again a, a long time ago, what we thought would happen is for for patients. Who had elevated or even not elevated circulating tumor DNA at time of diagnosis when they got their first dose of chemotherapy, if they had really chemotherapy sensitive disease, that at 24 hours the levels would really spike. And so we captured CT DNA levels at 24 hours. Um, we haven't, as, as you could sort of see in those spider plot graphs, we, we didn't see like big spikes at 24 hours. There, there are other types of cancer where they look at early like post chemotherapy or post radiation time points, and they they do see early spikes in circulating tumor DNA. Um, uh, we really start to see significant drops after usually after a couple of weeks. Um, but it yeah it is it is cleared after a period of time. Um, the our, our our the way our blood collection tubes work is they're they're collected into what are called cell stabilizing tubes, and they. Um, have a little bit of a reagent in the tube that helps actually stabilize the um, remaining blood cells in the blood sample. And then you sort of preserve the plasma layer and spin it down and, and isolate the plasma. And that that keeps the DNA from getting further degraded once it's been collected. Gotcha. I don't think I have anything. Um, um, Dr. Shulman, on the... So so I understand back on some of the earlier slides, you were showing that like 3% was, you know, uh, the sensitivity where under 3%, it would just be, you know, nothing, not quantified and then 3% and above. So when you're talking about high CT DNA, is it just 3% and above or was there any additional stratification above 3%? Yep, yeah, great, great question. Um, uh, we 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 do hope to address this in, in kind of the initial analysis of the leopard study in in our original seventy two patient cohort, um, the we we looked both at three percent and then we looked at something called an optimized cut point, which is a way of trying to figure out if you if you look at each level, what is the level that's kind of most prognostic and and we did that because when we looked at ctDNA amount as a continuous variable, we found that. That a, a patient's risk of relapse got higher and higher the higher the ctDNA level was. Um, and so in, in that original cohort, having a level above 18% was, was really um, much more prognostic than just being above 3%. But we, um, it, um, I don't know if it's, it's worth getting into sort of all the nitty gritty statistics of how the leopard study was designed, but it was really designed to be a prospective validation of that Three percent detectable, undetectable cut point, um, and so the whole like the 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 patient accrual and the way the statistical analysis was designed um, was was to validate that. But we did hypothesize that um, higher levels of circulating tumor DNA are 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 in, you know in, in increasingly worse. Um, and 
you could conversely, I think, hypothesize that if you had a test that could get you much lower down to like 1% or 0.5% or 0.05%, then you, you might um, be able to do the reverse and actually find, um, you know, the patients that um, are, are very likely to be cured, who are very likely to do well with, with standard therapy. Um, uh, and, and so there, there are, there's certainly plenty of tools in, in development out there, but given the, the leopard study is really a, a clinical validation study, we've really stuck with, with well-validated tools to do that. So they're, they're really ready to be implemented into a trial, um, once, once the study's done. Um, another question about, so the localized disease, so you had to have localized disease in order to enroll in the study. Yes. And what I find kind of interesting about that is like, I mean, I think generally people are always like, oh, most osteosarcoma patients do present um, with probably micrometastatic disease at diagnosis. So, you know, there might be a smaller percentage that present with um, visible metastatic disease, but um, I'm, it's kind of interesting. I'm wondering if you're able to start to quantify the percent of patients with local disease that actually might have, because now we can kind of measure yeah, metastatic yeah. disease. Yeah. I think this sort of gets to the the question of like what does CTDNA mean? Like what 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 does it mean to have high or low circulating tumor DNA? And what what people have hypothesized over the years is that it's some measure or quantification of overall disease burden and micrometastatic disease. And then there may be some tumors that have biology that causes them to shed DNA more than others, and and that may be associated with a more aggressive phenotype. Um, but I, I certainly think particularly in a, in a tumor like osteosarcoma where we know micrometastatic disease is present in, you know, really every patient who presents with localized disease, um, that it, that it is giving you some marker of, of micrometastatic disease. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, 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 one thing we'll get to look at in the leopard study in the final analysis is, is the amount of circulating tumor DNA associated with the size of the tumor. Um, and is it, giving you more information than the size of the tumor. I, I think what we we kind of think like looking many, many years down at the road in the future is that the clinical features that we know are important in osteosarcoma, like the presence of metastatic disease or having a pelvic primary um, or having a, um, a, you know, in some contexts, a larger or smaller tumor will remain important. And then circulating tumor DNA will help us refine what the risk is and, and what the treat, you know, what the treatment should be. Um, there was another question that just came in the chat, and it's asking, is it known whether there is diurnal variation in CT DNA levels? Um, that is that is a great question. Um, I I think there has been some work in this, but I, I have to be fully honest that I have not looked at this recently, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, I certainly don't know the answer to it um, in, in osteosarcoma. It's a great question. Um. Another one just came in, uh, says, sorry if I missed this, is the 3% cutoff just a concentration of ctDNA or a specific component, like a specific mutation? Yeah, great question. It's it's um, uh, an estimation of the total ctDNA burden, not just of a particular variant. Um, and and um, uh, again, so to, I guess to state in another way, kind of the example we gave at the beginning was a situation where at that particular time point, the CT DNA level was 22%. And so what, what, what we think that's telling us is that of all of the cell-free DNA, all of the DNA that's just floating around in the blood at that time, 22% of it is coming from osteosarcoma cells. Okay. Um, another question for you, Dr. Shulman, about um, uh, kind of following up on the whole like, you know, CT DNA and being, it's kind of like a proxy for a micrometastatic disease. Um, wondering like in the future, like, could you see this being, um, you know, for most, a lot of trials, you need to have measurable disease, but um, as you know, like really the gold standard is to be able to yeah. remove. And so, you know, perhaps having, um, you know, higher ctDNA could be a, a proxy for measurable disease in the future for clinical trials. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that's a, a fantastic question. 
Um, I, I do think that's like a conceivable possibility in, in the future. Um, we, we, we have a couple of trials um, that, that we've published over the last year or two, um, one of which was a, a trial for patients with osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, and the other was specifically a trial for patients with Ewing sarcoma. And we looked retrospectively at what happened to the circulating tumor DNA levels for each patient over time. And um, we, 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 we found that they were sort of generally correlated with the changes in, in tumor sizes as patients went through the trial. Um, but we probably need to do a little bit more work really understanding exactly sort of the, 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 the kinetics or the cadence at which ctDNA changes with um, response or not response to, to treatments. Um, but I, I think in, in, in osteosarcoma, for, for multiple reasons, there's a, there's a huge possibility there. One, as you said, for, for patients who have a valuable disease, meaning um, there's still osteosarcoma, but it's not something we can measure using standard clinical trial criteria, which is, it can truly be a barrier for, it, for, for patients getting onto clinical trials that having another marker that's not reliant on sort of measuring something on a radiographic image might be a way to follow disease and allow those patients to have access to the study and, and, and learn about whether or not the disease is improving their tumor. I, I think the other challenge sometimes with osteosarcoma is that the tumors don't always change in response to therapy in the same way other types of tumors do because of the bone deposition because it's, re it's really a bone tumor. And particularly for, 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 for bony sites of disease, they might lay down bone matrix that doesn't really shrink on the scan, even though um, the, the tumor may be responding. So the sort of conventional resist criteria that we use for patients with measurable diseases is, is sometimes like really not helpful in osteosarcoma. And so I, I think that, you know, there are many people thinking about what, what the right way to design clinical trials is for patients with osteosarcoma, but you could imagine that um, some kind of liquid biopsy analyte would, would be the right way to, to follow response to therapy because it's not so reliant on sort of having something measurable to start and then having that change in response to the treatment. Um, I guess kind of related to that. So part B of the, the Ewing's that the arm part B, I guess of the Ewing study, um, where it's, you're going to be following in, in surveillance, you'll be able to actually kind of compare and track, uh, the liquid biopsy measurement to imaging and maybe kind of gauge how sensitive it is because I, I mean, it, I, sorry, remind me on the timeline for that. Will the a liquid biopsies be happening kind of more frequently and in between imaging? Great, great question. The the liquid biopsies um, line up with scans at a set of predefined time points over about the first year and a half after finishing standard frontline therapy. Um, and so they're meant to not add extra blood draws. Um, patients are really meant to go through all of the same clinical care they would get, any standard uh, scans they would get any other standard blood tests they would get, um, and um, we we've tried to be very very thoughtful in how we designed the consent, how we talk to patients about the study, and how we interpret the results for patients because um, we 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 truly don't know um, if these particular tests are better or 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 um, or more sensitive or less sensitive than a scan, um, and so you know there's different there's different possibilities. Um, one possibility is that they're a little bit more sensitive than a scan and they might provide some additional information about picking things up earlier and letting us deal with things earlier. It's conversely possible that they're they're pretty similar to the sensitivity of a scan. And, um, you know, for example, it, it, it's sort of the outset of the leopard study we knew for patients with localized bone sarcomas, and it's actually very similar in Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma about half of patients at time of diagnosis with a localized tumor will have elevated ctDNA. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the other positive, the other possibility is that the tests are really a lot less sensitive than the scan, or it really depends on where the tumor is developing as to how much circulating tumor DNA there is. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's why it's important to try and do as part of a research study where we can really ensure that we're increasing our learning and understanding of, um, of the tests. Um, yeah. 
So maybe it might be like a part C afterwards to see, <laughs> depending on what you find out from part B, or perhaps even more frequent. Because I mean, I do think, especially um, immediately after therapy, that blood draws are pretty frequent compared to imaging. So patients are usually getting a blood draw um, anyway, it'd be easier yeah. to access. Yeah, yeah, you might say why well, was part B only for patients with Ewing sarcoma. And, and so at the time that was, the, we sort of started working on that a, about two years ago and it opened about a year ago. Um, it, at that time of sort of what was available commercially and what we could use, there was a test that was really focused on it and you know, that had a really focused coverage of the Ewing sarcoma gene. And we could feel, you know, very confident in, in the results we see and actually still having, having looked at, at many of these tests now, um, they, they, they still sometimes do require a little bit of, of, of sort of expert interpretation and, and help thinking through. But I, I think actually even over the last year or two, there are some options that, that would really be applicable in, in osteosarcoma. And so like we're, we're getting more to a point where you can envision a, a, a part a, an osteosarcoma part C. Um, uh, and, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think that, I think that would be a, a good next goal. We don't, we don't want to be using research only tests for, for, you know, for, for the next five or six years. Um, yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think that's so exciting about all of this and your study is that it does seem like it's so close to having clinical benefit. I mean, even just part B, right. Is that you're, you are basically using it, um, for, for clinical return of results um, and uh, and kind of seeing how that might uh, impact care, I guess, right over that time. Um, yeah. But I did want to ask a little bit about the different types of, um, I mean, it's great that you're using this commercially available um, test, the Foundation One uh, Liquid CDX. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, because I of, of just like, you know, not all uh, tests are created equal depending on the disease, I guess, depending on yeah. the type of panel it is. So could you maybe address that a little bit, I guess, for people that might be thinking about, oh, like there are different liquid biopsies offered by different yeah. companies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I, I guess I, I should say, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't do any consulting for liquid biopsy companies and I don't, I don't receive, um, uh, I don't receive any directed research support from from liquid biopsy companies, but I, we do have obviously research collaborations. Um, uh, uh, so, um, you know, I, I think here really like the devil is in the details, and and um, if you're going to think about using one of these in the clinic, it's it's really important to have um, a clinician who really understands the test that's being sent and what is likely to come back from that. Um, and the the sort of pros and the cons to that test, um, there um, there are some tests out there that sort of focus on relatively limited gene panels and um, might be really really well suited for um, uh, somebody who has colon cancer and you're looking for a very specific mutation that you're thinking about using a very specific drug for and. Um, you know, they, they may be um, in a situation where their disease has come back, they have a relatively large disease burden, and, and when it's sent, you know, you, you think at the outset, it's pretty likely they're going to have circulating tumor DNA. I really want to know about this one specific variant, but that particular test um, may not be that helpful for somebody with um, uh, a very different disease, such as um, osteosarcoma, where actually, you know, whatever that specific variant was, we, re we really never see. Um, but what we're, what we're starting to see, I think, is that there are more tests that are, they're doing more than just looking for a specific variant that you can target with a drug. There's tests that are really designed to quantify circulating tumor DNA as something that can be followed over time. Um, and so, um, like a good example of that is the Signatera test that's made by a company called Natera, in which they make a patient-specific panel um, by by sequencing a patient's tumor and then and then track that over time, um, and and then some of these other tests that are are conventionally sort of panel sequencing, looking at different genes, they they're doing some similar things to what we're doing, looking at copy number changes across the genome to try and give you a, a quantification of circulating tumor DNA, um, and so uh, again, I I think. Um, 
without sort of going into a lot of details of any specific test, I, I, I do think the important thing to keep in mind is, I, you know, either looking for um, a research study or, or if, 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 you know, this is something you have a question for about your doctor, really kind of thinking carefully about what you, you know, what, what you, what you um, are, are looking to find and, and whether or not the, the test is likely to help you find that. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go, on, go ahead. Oh, I'm just got one question. Uh, so was there a standardization of like the blood draw site, whether that's like left arm, right arm out of a port or a hand and like, would the proximity of the blood draw site affect like uh, CT DNA concentration or is that like not a thing? Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the blood draws were really just drawn along with any, um, typically with any clinical labs, the patient was going to get. And so most, most of them are really drawn from ports, um, because mo most of them were drawn on, on therapy. Um, I, I don't think we know that the blood draw site, um, is likely to make a huge difference, but you could imagine that if a blood draw was done in the same extremity as, as a, as an active tumor, that, that. That in theory, like if you were drawing blood from the venous drainage of, of where a tumor was, that that could impact your draw. Um, but um, but yeah, typically they're drawn from a, a port site. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, so I think like currently a pretty standard test um, for, from Foundation One, for example, is the Foundation One heme test for slides for like if you have tissue samples. Mm -hmm. And um, what is, how, how does like the sensitivity of liquid biopsy compare to FFP when you're looking not just at uh, quantifying ctDNA, but actually using it to look at the different variants that eventually like further down the road might be able to help inform, you know, different types of treatment. I'm just wondering how that compares and like, if you can biopsy, you know, is it still like use FFP? And, yeah. 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 Yeah, so for for osteosarcoma, I, th I think that's a question that still needs to be answered. Um, but um, you know, I, th I think a, a useful way to sort of um, think about that is if you're sending a test that has a way again to try and give you um, quantity of circulating tumor DNA, we think that the sensitivity of finding a specific variant will go up the more ctDNA there is at that time point. So. Um, I guess a, another way to another way to say that is, um, um, if if there was a situation where um, a patient had um, a, like a a, a single um, pulmonary nodule, it, it relapsed, that was removed, it was sequenced with something like the foundation one test, and it was found to have CCN1 amplification. If you draw a liquid biopsy a week later it's probable that the liquid biopsy would have about 0% sensitivity because you, you would sort of imagine at that point, there's, there's no circulating tumor DNA level, uh, or there's no, there's no residual circulating tumor DNA. I think conversely, it, in a moment when a patient had a relatively large burden of circulating tumor DNA, if it's a variant that's on the panel, the sensitivity should be pretty good. Um, uh, but, you know, for, for other, um, diseases where these are used like very frequently in clinical practice, like lung cancer, um, typically the way it's thought about is if you send your liquid biopsy and the ctDNA burn comes back greater than 10% or so, but you don't see the variant, you can feel pretty confident the variant's not there. If the ctDNA percent comes back very low, like less than 10% or less than 1%, then you would really need to reflex to sequencing tissue. Um, and get a new get a new biopsy or go back and sequence original tissue and make sure that you're not missing the variant that you were looking for. Okay. Okay. We are we are like almost out of time, but I had one question I just wanted to throw at you just because I thought it was interesting. So I come across like something called CTRNA, and I just wanted to get your thoughts. Like, what is that, and how does that does that come into play in the future sometime? Yeah. Um, I, I, I was so intentional to try and really just focus on circulating tumor DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, throwing you off track. Um, uh, yeah, so that, so we, so we, we've been very focused on, on circulating tumor DNA, but I, I, as I mentioned with liquid biopsy, there are many other things that fall under that umbrella and, and cell-free RNA is one of those things. Um, I, 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 I think that's a, a technology that requires a little bit more study before it's sort of ready for prime time. And, um, is not, we think is maybe not stable sort of in the same way that circulating tumor DNA is in the peripheral blood, 
Um, but there may be other ways to get at cell-free cell RNA by looking at other things that it's sort of bound to in the blood, like that that helps sort of stabilize it. So um, I, I, I think there's potential there. I'm not an expert in, in, in this technology. Um, and I, I know there's a lot of good people working on it. So. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shulman, for joining us today on Osteobites and for making it better for AYA sarcoma patients. More information on this and all Osteobites can be found on our website at mibagents.org, on our MIB Agents YouTube channel, and at your favorite podcast place. And next Thursday, we are going to be joined by Dr. Fan Yang. Um, she is an associate professor at Stanford University with joint appointments in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Bioengineering. And she will be discussing her work on tissue engineering strategies for elucidating OS biology and drug discovery. You can find our Osteobites lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for topics that you'd like to hear about, just share them with us at events at mibages.org. Thank you again, Dr. Shulman and Walker for spending an hour with us today and for all of you and for all the great questions. We hope to see you back here on Osteobites on February 29th, which is Leap Day, uh, when we talk to Dr. Yang. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Dr. Shulman. Thanks, Walker.